phylacteries. Phylacteries today. Now some look at me like, what is he talking about? What's that? Phylacteries. Now I needed to check that out myself as well. It's a word which is used in the Bible only once in the New Testament. But before I go into what it is and whether it's supposed to be used today, let's go into the scriptures from the Old Testament, which some of the Jews used and use to justify phylacteries in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the question, of course, we need to ask ourselves is, is that something we should be doing? Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm reading verses 6 to 8. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6, and of course the context is right after the Ten Commandments had been pronounced. We read, and these words, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, we can also look at Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 18. This scripture is given right after the commandments were announced again a second time. And then we read in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 18, Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So how are we to follow this commandment today? Are we to follow the example of the Jews at the time of Christ, or the example of some Jews today? As Friedman, commentary of the Torah, explains, the command to bind the law on one's hand and to bind it between the eyes, and I quote, came to be taken literally, requiring one to wear boxes, or tefillin in the Hebrew, on one's arm and head containing passages from the Torah the ten, I mean the, the first, first, first five books of Moses. In the Tanakh, however, which explains the entire Old Testament, this commentator says, this expression is meant figuratively, meaning to keep these teachings at hand and right before one's eyes. Now, when we look into the New Testament, we find a reference in Matthew chapter 23 and in verse five. Matthew chapter 23 and verse five. Here, Jesus Christ is attacking the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the scribes. And he says in here, in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 5, But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, or broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. So here, the reference is to the phylacteries. And it's pretty much the same as the tefillin in the Hebrew. The Pharisees derive their phylacteries from these passages I just quoted, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11, and a few more. Now, the Ryrie Study Bible says, some Jews still wear phylacteries bound on the forehead and on the left arm above the elbow. A phylactery was a square leather box which contained four strips of parchment on which were written portions from Exodus and Deuteronomy. During prayer, one was worn on the forehead between the eyebrows brows, and another on the left arm close to the elbow. They were held in place by leather bands which the Pharisees made broad to attract more attention to themselves. Phylacteries had only begun to be used by the ultra-pious in Christ's day. Now, some commentators say they began using them after the Babylonian captivity. But the point is, they were never used in that way at the time of Moses. In fact, these phylacteries 
had been given a superstitious application. In Commentary on the Holy Bible, Domelo writes this. The rabbis held these phylacteries in the highest veneration. They were to be kissed when put on or off. They were a preservative against demons, whence their name phylacteries, i.e. amulets, from a Greek word meaning to guard. They were sworn by, and by touching them, they would swear. Now, Young, the analytical concordance of the Holy Bible, defines the word phylactery as a guard or a charm. And Vine, Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, writes, and I quote, any kind of safeguard, especially to denote an amulet. It was supposed to have potency as a charm against evils and demons. So that already should tell us that there's obviously something wrong with wearing these kinds of phylacteries or tefillin as the Hebrew has it. Now, when Christ made the statement in Matthew 23, he didn't approve of it, what they were doing. He was just saying, you are using this in order to show your own self-righteousness, being hypocritical as you are. But the question for us today is, and I'm bringing this up because people who have, let's say, relationships with Messianic Jews insist that this has to be done today. So the question is, do passages like Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11 were meant to be applied figuratively or literally? And do these scriptures allow or even command the use of phylacteries or these tefillin, as we have just read about? Well, let's look at a few more scriptures where the same wording is used in Exodus chapter 13. And here, as we will see, it has nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. Exodus 13, let's start reading in verse 7. Exodus 13 and verse 7. It says, unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. Verse 8, and you shall tell your son in that day, saying, this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on your hands, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. What law? What ordinance? Well, the law and the ordinance having to do having to do with the days of unleavened bread, having to do with coming out of Egypt. We keep reading in verse 15. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontlets, between your eyes, for by strength of hands the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Again, the reference being to the days of unleavened bread, being to the death of the firstborn. It applied here to the historical situation pertaining to the death of the firstborn, the exodus of Egypt. But now notice a few more scriptures. Proverbs chapter 3. Let's notice Proverbs chapter 3, and let's look at verse 3. It says, let not mercy and truth forsake you, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Here we see a reference to mercy and truth, which are to be bound around one's neck, and which are to be written on the tablets of your heart. Now, how do you do that literally? It's obviously a figurative statement. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 21. Here it says, Bind them continually upon your heart, 
tie them around your neck. So something is to be bound on and around the neck, but what? Well, here the context is a command and admonition against adultery. You look at verse 20, where it says, My son, keep your father's command. Do not forsake the law of your mother. What command? What law? Keep reading in verse 27. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Verse 28. Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. And also verse 24, to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. So here's this particular portion, which is to be bound around the neck and in front of your eyes, has to do with the law against adultery. Now notice Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 3. Proverbs 7 and verse 3. Again, the same concept is conveyed here. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablets of your heart. But what? What is to be bound around the tablets of our heart? Verse 5. That they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. So again, here in this context, the tablets of the heart have to do with writing on them the law against adultery. Now, if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6, let us notice again how that is worded, and let us see why this has to be, has to be a figurative meaning. It cannot be, and wasn't supposed to be, used literally. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6, let's read it again. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Not outside, not being carried somehow in a box. They shall be in your heart. And then it goes on to say in verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Not literal frontlets in front of your eyes. They shall be as frontlets. See, God's law is to be as a sign on our hands, as frontlets between our eyes. Now this includes what we do with our hands and what and how we think. Let's take the Sabbath as an example. On it we refrain from work with our hands and we worship God with our mind. But let's note another example in Revelation chapter 13. And let's look at verse 16. Here we talk about a situation which will arise in the future. And here two beasts are described. And it says in Revelation 13 and verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. So people will receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And let's keep reading what this will do. Verse 17, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now some take that literally. And they say, oh, this is going to be some kind of a mark that's some kind of a chip something which is going to be implanted. This is all symbolical. This is all figurative. It has to do with the fact that people will reject the Sabbath commandments and the commandments regarding the annual holy days and replace them with Sunday worship, with worship on days like Christmas or Easter. See, they will use their hands to violate the Sabbath. They will use their minds to not worshiping God, and they will use their hands to, use, uh, to worship God and to work on days not meant to be in the, in the eyes of God. So you see how this is all to be understood in a figurative way. You see, we don't need physical reminders today, such as phylacteries, to remind us of the law of God 
at least we shouldn't. Today, God's Holy Spirit reminds us, reminds us of God's law, and the law of God is being written in our hearts, in our minds, as we had already seen in Deuteronomy, which was supposed to be the case. In Romans 5 and verse 5, a scripture you all know, it says that the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the love of God? 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3 defines it as keeping the commandments. You see, the law of God is supposed to be written in our hearts, not to be carried in a box or as a front that's in front of our eyes. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10 makes this very clear. And when we think in terms of how these boxes were used in a very superstitious and ungodly way, and apparently are still being used that way today by some, we should be clearly be able to see that that is not anything we should have anything to do with. But in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10 in conclusion, let's notice how we are to approach how to keep God's law. Hebrews 8 and in verse 10, God says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. But we are spiritual Israel today, and we should already be under the conditions of that new covenant. And notice how that's defined. Says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Thank you.